So that brings us to Revelation 7. And this is a different type of seal. So God moves from talking about his seals that are on the deed to earth that are on a document. And he moves to talking about his seals on people, his seal that's on a person that's on people. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you have his seal right now. If you've received Jesus as your savior, then you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. So not only is this seal a pledge of ownership, but the seal is a person. It's the Holy Spirit. So Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, in whom you also trusted, trusted in Jesus, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So we have been purchased with a price and we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Holy Spirit, wherefore you are sealed until the day of redemption. Once sealed, always sealed. The Holy Spirit holds on to you and delivers you to Jesus once you have received Jesus as your Savior. So we have this promise that we're now the purchased possession and we have the seal of God on us. The Holy Spirit indwells us. And even though we cannot see this seal, it's evident to the spiritual realm who we belong to. You know, we can look at, we can look at each other and not necessarily know if we really have the Holy Spirit or not, but the angels and the demons, they know who you belong to. We are sealed until the rapture, meaning we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until he delivers us to Jesus. And so those who die in Christ before they are with him now, and they will be united to their bodies when the rapture happens. The sealing of 144,000. So those who are sealed during the church age, during these 2,000 years, are removed at the rapture. So we see... We are seeing a new sealing happen at Revelation 7 with the remnant of Israel. And so we see this is a new sealing that's happening because when we see, receive Jesus, we immediately have that seal. And so this, this dispensation of time during the, the seven-year tribulation, God does something a little bit different. Um, or it could be that perhaps this 144,000 we're reading it as though it is a moment in time, but perhaps this is God working on them during that period of time between the rap, between the beginning of the tribulation and and them, their full number of one hundred forty four thousand coming in. I, we don't fully know that by how it's by how it's given. So the one hundred forty four thousand are mentioned here in Revelation seven, and they're also mentioned in Revelation fourteen. God seals 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. God is very clear on who these are. This is Israel. And they are young virgin men, according to Revelation 14, 4. God's very clear on who these are. So Revelation 7, 1 through 8. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. And then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun and with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So I'm going to pause right there for a second. So you see, the wrath of God is not going to fall on those that he sealed. We're gone. Those that have already been sealed with the Holy Spirit are removed before God's wrath falls. But here we see God is sealing these 144 of Israel, this remnant of Israel. He is sealing them before he is going to pour his wrath out. And so I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel, 12,000 Judah, 12,000 Reuben, 12,000, he goes on to 
each tribe, the one that he does not mention is Dan. And so, but through all the tribes, um, 12, 12,000 from each tribe are sealed. And so we see that these, these go and they share the gospel. God knows who they are. God knows who these people are all over the planet right now. They don't know who they are. Um, I think this is interesting because it just shows how God is already preparing the people. You know, we talked about this, the Ark replica. And they've actually brought this to um, some of the camps in in the army, and they uh, and they claimed um, that it's that it, that it helps that that's been helping them having the Ark there. Um, of course, this this is extremely interesting because it is this is the first time on the Temple Mount. Because remember, I don't know if you guys that have been to Israel, you're not allowed to pray unless you're Muslim on the Temple Mount. So this is completely against status quo. A Kohen, a young Levite, going up and reciting the priestly prayer. First time since Jesus this happened. Also, we've got going up and praying. A large group went up and prayed during tabernacles on the temple mount. Again, this is not done. God's, God's chosen people, Israel, they're returning to him. We know they're going to be fooled at first. They're going to fall for this man of sin, but God is bringing them in. And they will come in. And so we see the largest revival is going to be sparked by Israel. God told Israel to be priest, to show the world who he is. And they're going to start doing that during the tribulation, during Jacob's trouble. These 144,000 are going to spark an incredible revival bigger than anything the world has ever seen. And even though there's great deception during the tribulation and there'll be huge numbers of people that are, are going to go to hell because they have rejected Jesus, there's also the greatest outpouring of God's salvation ever seen at one period of time. The largest revival ever is going to happen during the tribulation. A number that cannot be counted from all nations and languages will receive Jesus. And many of those saved will be a result of the sealed 144,000. So God's promise for Israel from the beginning was to be a light pointing to God for all the nations for the Gentiles, a light to the Gentiles. So here we see the reality of that happening. So Revelation 7, 9 through 17. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from, um, from, from every language, tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches, we're going to explain some of this, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders addressed to me and said, who are these clothed in white robes? Remember, this is a... This is more. This isn't the same crowd. Well, this may be the same crowd, but this is this is more than what we saw in um with the fifth seal. This is this huge multitude that is more than you can even count. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. 
The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. And so this is this is just so, so cool because we just we just studied the Feast of Tabernacles and we just looked at the water libation ceremony from the Feast of Tabernacles. And the imagery in that group that we just read is, on, I mean, God wanted us to know that it's associated with the water libation of the Feast of Tabernacles because it's it's unmistakable. During the water libation ceremony the feast from the Feast of Tabernacles, the priest would wear white robes and they'd carry palm branches singing Hosanna Rabbah, save us please. So Jesus is going to guide them to springs of living water. And here they are singing a song about salvation and singing for Hosanna. And so here we see this beautiful picture making this connection here to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the celebration of the ingathering of the nations. And here we see a representation of every tribe and nation and language and people before the throne with palm branches. And that is exactly what you see at the libation ceremony um, for the Feast of Tabernacles. And so we see the promises given to these that reveal their struggle that they've gone through during the tribulation. They hunger no more. So even before the mark of the beast is instituted, famine will cause many to go hungry. And so, you know, after the mark, of course, people will go hungry because they can't buy or sell. But even before then, we saw that extreme famine. And so here there's this promise, you're not going to be hungry anymore. This great multitude. They'll no longer thirst. Uh, wormwood. We're going to look at this next week is a star fall falling from heaven and um, a, a big, a big asteroid meteor. This, this causes great devastation in revelation eight ten, and it poisons the waters. And then we will see with the third trumpet causes one third of the sea to turn to blood. The third bowl of wrath turns the rivers and springs to blood. So the water is going to be so tainted during the tribulation that people will be thirsty. And here God is saying, you're no longer going to be thirsty. I'm going to give you the living water. And the sun shall not strike them or scorching heat. And we see in Revelation 16, 8, that, a, that the fourth angel will pour out his bowl on the sun and it will be given power to scorch people with fire. It'll be extreme heat. The sun is going to do some very strange things toward um, the end part of the tribulation. So we see these people are coming out of the later part of the tribulation and God is comforting them. Their nightmare is now over. Jesus is their shepherd. He will guide them and he's going to wipe all tears away. So the final thought here is the tribulation is the worst time in human history. Now, Jesus told us that. In Revelation 6 and 7, we see the sovereignty and the authority of God revealed. Everything that happens is him releasing it, releasing this that the world has wanted to do. And he finally releases it that the world does what the world wants to do. And that's the first five seals is what the world wants to do. His wrath is letting people do, is giving people over to their evil desire. That's his own, that's part of God's judgment is letting people do what they want. Now, as Jesus breaks the seals on the scroll, the deed to earth, the evil desire of man that have been held back, that have been restrained, is released. And man gets what he's been crying out for. Psalms 2, 1 through 5. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He'll let them do what they want to do. And then he shall speak unto them in his wrath 
and vex them in his sore displeasure. And that right there is a perfect explanation of what he does during the tribulation period. The beginning, he lets them have their way. And then after the Antichrist comes in and says, I'm God, God's full wrath pours out on, on this evil world rejecting him. But this wrath of God is mercy. Jeremiah 37, how awful that day will be. This is speaking of Jacob's trouble. This is speaking of the tribulation. None will be like it. It's a time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved out of it. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will break the yoke off their necks and tear off their bonds and no longer will strangers enslave them. And so we see the verse before was the world, the, the evil leaders saying, we don't want to be enslaved by God. But God's saying that he is actually going to be breaking the yoke that evil people have put on his people through the tribulation. So God in his mercy will take distress and turn it into salvation for Israel and also for, for those of the Gentiles who put their trust in the king of the Jews, Jesus. The bonds that will end up being broken will be the ones of the enemy over lost people. And so praise God for his mercy that we see in the darkest of places. And this is the end of man's deception and man's pain. And then the world goes into the millennial reign. So um, next week we'll take we'll take off in chapter eight and we'll we'll see where where God leads us, God willing, right? And so God bless you and hope you are encouraged and have a great week.